I'm ready. So, ladies and gentlemen, now uh, we have Eve back again. And this time, as much as you might guys might be thinking, oh, it's going to be something about the nakshatra. Actually, no. Today is actually on the Rashis, the zodiac signs. So she's going to tell us things that perhaps even I don't even know about them. So uh, welcome again, Eve, to Thanks. Care's channel. So yes, I was actually surprised when you contacted and said, instead of nakshatra, you wanted to talk about Rashi. So yeah, let's... let's uh, hear on that particular subject that well, is we, overlooked yes well we had kind of had a fluid chat about some of the rashis and um yeah just kind of realized how much there's subtleties to them that i don't feel yeah. discussed much so yeah it would be nice to um you know me i always open a little bit with a mantra if that's okay okay um, <clears throat> Om Ganganapatehi Namaha Om Aim Saraswatye Namaha Om Vakdevye Chavitmahe Varanchi Patni Chadimahi Danovani Prachodaya okay, Thank you. And also, yeah. I <laughs> it's very silly. People think may think this is silly, but um, I really like to speak and just say this at the beginning of any talk now or any session I have with people. Um, mm -hmm. Please be protected from my ignorance. I'm not a guru. <laughs> I just please be protected from my ignorance. So I'm just sharing freely here. Um, yeah. Helpful. Um, that's nice, but um, I don't want to be mistaken as uh, an authority. This is just sharing. <laughs> mm -hmm. For sure. Okay. I'm going to share my screen for a minute. Okay. And um, because we're going to be talking about Rashis, I wanted to start us out with a basic symbol. And a lot of people discuss sacred geometry now, uh, so on and so forth, these yantras. This is one of the most basic that you'll see throughout the East in many forms. And uh, maybe people don't even realize that many indigenous civilizations also used this six pointed star. Um, and this is very relevant to the study of Jyotish in general, and it's very relevant to life. And Jyotish is a book of life. I mean, it's Jyoti Ishwar, it is the light God, mm -hmm. but it's really the study of Kal Purush. It's really the study of the time person. And the, how the time person is consuming the soma, because time is seen as an agni. Okay, so we need to establish that first before we even speak of Rashi's. We need to establish an understanding that all of life is a play between agni and soma somehow. Uh, all of the older texts have constant reference to agni soma. Mm -hmm. Mahadeva is called, you know, three call Agni, right? Three call Agni, the three fires of time. Time is a consumer. Agni is always consuming. And what is Agni consuming? But Soma, in some form, lesser or greater degrees of consumption. So time is consuming our material body. It's a form of soma. This body is a form of soma. Why is the moon janma nakshatra? It's not called emotional nakshatra. It's not called the nakshatra of intuition or fantasy. It's actually called janma, birth. And the moon's mula trikona is in the second house, natural second house, vrashab rashi, right? And it's yeah. uchab. So Vrishab really has a lot to do with Chandra. We get the first nourishment in the second house. <clears throat> our mother, whether our mother nourishes us or rejects us and does not nourish us, it's all depending on this mystery of Janma, the moon. 
Moon is Soma. So the moon is that which is to be consumed. This, is, this might sound deep and esoteric in some way or abstract, but it's really not. If you observe yeah. all life, everything is eating something else. Everything. So this moon is called Deva Bojana as well. Chandra is called Deva Bojana, the food of the gods. <clears throat> and so this Vrashab Rashi really becomes critical for life for growth in the heart of it you have rohani nakshatra with rohana shakti which is the power of growth but you have the moon being ucha and kritika agni soma is ucha and agni <laughs> because their relationship is very sacred and all life starts with temperature as well temperature simple temperature if something is frozen it's stuck doesn't move yeah. there's chemistry so chemistry starts with the introduction of heat <laughs> really it's introduction of extremes actually there there's there's exceptions to this rule of course in physics but i'm just saying let's not get too technical simplicity temperature even changes life so we have this very clear um, view from the rishis of what vrishab rashi is um, and it's heavily influenced by moon. But why this, this star you see in all of the yantras, um, this is no specific yantra, I just kind of chose one online. Um, <clears throat> just to show that very commonly you will see the six pointed star, okay? Now, speaking of Agni and Soma, we're really here boiling everything down to pairs of opposites. So if you study any of the sacred arts, and I would even say the, uh, the vidyas that are more, you know, just isolated to one area of life, like Ayurveda. So those of you who are Ayurvedic students, you know that you're working with a set of 10 pairs, 20 gunas, which are all opposite qualities. And when you check the pulse or when you, when you have darshanam, which is to see, see the patient and assess their qualities, whether they have high agni, whether they have high jala, whether, whether they have high vayu, all of this, you start to see them. You also listen to the tone of their voice. You feel them. You check their pulse. And it's all to find how these qualities are balanced or out of balance whether we have quantities of too much or too little. Now, moon is also this indicator, too much or too little, increase, decrease, is all the business of the moon. We start out as this little baby, we're born, we grow to pornima, right? We hit a point of fullness mm -hmm. in a human body, and then we wane, all of us, no matter, we start waning again, amavasya, we die, new life. And then, you know, you worship the ancestors on Amavasya. So all of this is in the Rashis, actually, because the Grahas rule the Rashis. They're actually, they actually, um, if you look at the Rashis, there's a lot of secrets to life um, by the pairing of opposites. Okay, so there's always opposite qualities. This has nothing to do with uh, current discussions going on on gender or anything. So I don't want anyone to mistake me. If I use male, female concepts, this has nothing to do with the current, anything like that. There's always opposites, okay? There's always opposites. So it doesn't matter if you get two people of the same gender in a relationship, somehow those opposites are going to show up in order for the relationship to work. Mm -hmm. Anything of the same quality um, repels it. You see, like with batteries, with... So I'm just going off of basic physics here. We have all day, night, hot, cold, light, dark. Then we have receptive and generative, okay? So we have like the seed. Now look at the seed. I often say that the entire tree is in the seed. The intelligence of the entire tree, the architecture, is in the seed okay yeah but that seed if you leave it in the sun it's going to dry up and die 
it's going to dry up and die, right? What does it mean? Mm -hmm. It needs to pierce the soil or it needs to be put in water. It needs jala or prutvi. What we call the feminine elements, that just means receptive. The generative needs the receptive. It needs to be exposed to the form of shakti that produces growth. So in the darkness of the soil, black, pitch black darkness, which everyone's so afraid of for some reason, I don't know, but in the yeah. dark, growth happens. At night, the plants that have been in this intense chemical photosynthesis from the sun, from Agni, get the nourishment of the darkness and the gentleness of the moonlight to complete their growth cycle. So darkness is very important. Okay, so you have the opposite, complementing each other, producing life. So in the six-pointed star, you actually see the upward pointing triangle, which is the generative element. And you have the downward pointing triangle, which is nothing but the yoni, the receptive, the receptive one. So why is Shukra shown as a six pointed star? Shukra is the karaka of all union. All unions are through Shukra. Every single union that you have with life, shukra is a natural yoga karaka. So when we look at the rashis, we need to really contemplate the grahas that are assigned the rulership. But not only that, the opposites, the opposite becomes defining of the rashi. You cannot leave out the opposite. If you're going to study mesha, you must study Tula. If you're going to study Vrishab, you must study Vrishchika, Scorpio, Taurus, yeah. and Scorpio. Mithuna, Dhanu Rashi. Karak Rashi, Cancer, you must study Marka. Um, sorry, Makara. <laughs> it is Marka. But you must study Capricorn. So it goes on like this. So there's a lot of secrets that you can unlock about the Rashis uh, just by understanding this basic principle that's all through, um, really all through Vedic literature. Um, <clears throat> so one of the ones I like to start with, and Kapilji, please interrupt, you know, ask, it helps me when you ask questions. I know, yeah, those... I was just going to ask you too. I think you're segueing into that process. I was just going to say, so how would we then look at Cancer and then Capricorn? Because we understand they're opposite and we understand their Karkavastas, but how do we then understand by this symbol of merging? and then regenerating something new. Is that the concept or is it we're just seeing the opposite image of a zodiac sign and knowing that, yes, this is why it's what it is because look at the opposite is completely opposite of what the sign is, you know? Well, if you neglect the nakshatras, you're gonna have a hard time. The nakshatras are very helpful um, because Jyotish is meant to function as a full body of Kal Purush. Mm -hmm. So one mistake I commonly find in Jyotish, and I, I'm not really a corrector type personality. I really don't like correcting uh, people. You'll find me just listening instead most of the time. But if I yeah. have a private session with someone, I'm more likely to open up about this. But there is, there, there is a big problem in Jyotish with asking the liver to do the function of the kidneys or the kidneys to do the function of the heart, meaning that we're not really putting the things in place based on Kal Purush. Like, like Vimshotri Dasha is an actual Nakshatra Dasha. Even it's said in Brihat or Shastra, he doesn't mince words with that. He assigns Dashapatis, which are lords of the time period mm -hmm. and no one's using them there as a matter of fact that well they might be using them in some way but what i find is a, a reliance on rashis so what happens is no one's contemplating okay the rishis often give you 
two plus two, but they don't tell you it equals four. This is important because they expect you to know. So when he gives you the fact that Vimshotri Dasha applies to every human on earth, that should tell you right there, it's an important Dasha. Right. He also says, he also tells you, assigns you the Dashapatis. Now they change per nakshatra dasha, so it's clearly not a nakshatrapati. The only nakshatrapati, the only lord of nakshatras is moon. Right. Rashis don't have yonis. Okay? Nakshatras do. Yeah. This is important. This is actually very important to understand which organ the nakshatras are, what they do. They have yonis. They're receptive. They receive a seed. They're very... Uh, much responsible for karma palam, for the fruits of the trees growing. So everything that people are trying to determine in Jyotish, if we're leaving out the nakshatras, we're leaving out the shakti that's making the seed grow. This is not just personality and feelings and all of this. It's a big misconception. Jaimini says for an event to happen, the moon must be involved for a concrete event because the moon is material. Why do you think it's yeah. military? is in Taurus, the most material sign. The moon has more to do with Taurus almost than Shukra. Shukra has to do with Taurus because of life. Once again, Chandra and, and Shukra, because they carry Jala Tatwa, it has to do with life. But you, you look at this and every single human being is born into the nakshatra, uh, sorry, the dashapati of the moon. They're not born into moon dasha. They're not born into the rashipati of their moon. They're not born into the lord of the first dasha. They're born into the dashapati. Now, so you tell me why, when I'm in Mars dasha, why are people saying, oh, Mars is the lord of the third? Why aren't we looking at the, the grahas that are in Mangal's nakshatras because we've already been given the answer. The Ra reason okay, okay, I see what you're saying. Um, it's not for example, if some somebody's going through Mars Dasha and they have uh, Jupiter in Mrixira, Sun sitting in Chatra, so they're gonna become make a link with Mars during the Dasha and also will let me be give under you the command of. Maybe Mars. we should even look at a chart for that at the end here. So okay. we can, because this is something I find people, it's a simple thing. It's like a two plus two, but I think our over reliance on Rashi's from Western culture, I'm going to be very honest. I think that's very Western. Our over reliance on Surya, even the 365 day year, no one's questioning it. No one even right. knows what it is. And it has, it has no relevance to the moon. There's an actual synodic year that astronomers use. I've had people think I'm, they've, they've told me, they're like, you're intuitive. That's why you're using the lunar year. And I kind of laugh. I, I'm like, no, actually it's quite technical. There's an actual synodic year that mm -hmm. measures lunar cycles. There's actual different years in astronomy for different demarcations of time. And the 365 day year, there's not even 360 degrees in the entire Rashi chart. If you look at Gochara, the transits, yeah. you're watching the sun go through the Rashis in 360 degrees. Right. Please explain that to me. <laughs> because that is actually a very seasonal year. It marks seasons very well. The equinox year, like the but the equinox year, it, see, that's a very important year, and it's used for something else. <laughs> but when you're looking at a Rashi chart, you've got 12 Rashis, 30 degrees each. The sun moves a degree a day, never goes retrograde, never waxes, never wanes, is steady. And that's why he's the natural Atma Karaka. The Surya is Atma Jyoti. So that's why the Titi of the moon becomes important. Because the light that chittas, the, this lifetime, the light that the chittas is illumined by is coming from Surya. But Surya right. doesn't change. He doesn't change his course for anyone. As a matter of fact, he marks the ecliptic. 
So he's not a receptive energy at all. He's not uh, the same as moon, which mimics a human life. One of the biggest mistakes in Jyotish we may be making is thinking the moon is emotional. The moon is your body. It's you. It's the food of the gods. Time, Kala, is, is a god. It is eating you. <laughs> Kala is eating you. Uh, that Kalagni is devouring your body. And so the moon is that material. It's your blood type. I mean, think about how hard that is to change. Soria is actually your bones. So no matter what you do, when they find your bones in the future, they have your identity to some degree. So Soria, Soria Chandra and Mangal are the hardest to actually escape in one lifetime. Everyone's fearful of Shani, Rahu, and Ketu. But actually yeah. those guys are renovators. But Soria, Chandra, and Mangal are very hard to alter because that's Atma Karka. Who understands even what Atma is? <laughs> right. Manas karka, no one even understands manas because it's not your emotions. It might contain mm -hmm. emotions, but that's a misunderstanding that it is emotional. All the grahas give emotions. So manas, we need to contemplate that. I would say to study, study yoga shastra for that. Don't listen to Jyotishis like even me as a dummy. Don't listen to me. <laughs> go study yourself. Re really, go study yoga shastra to understand what manas is. And then try to actually experience it. Then Mars is natural deha karka, the indicator of the body. So he's also an indicator of surgery and all of that. So if we want to alter our body, we must, you know, cut it, do something extreme, you know. So the Mongol Surya and Chandra are really big companions through the lifetime, according to Jyotish Shastra. Mongol is even said to be the sperm cell the shape, it looks like a spear. Anything that pierces is mangal. And the fluid is shukra. The transport is shukra. The code is ketu. The genetic code is the ketu. The ovum, there's debate on whether that's chandra or surya, but you can see it even looks like chandra or surya. Yeah. Okay, so natural fit. So, these guys knew the science of life. It, it's, really, it's really not some esoteric thing that's out of reach. If spirituality is real, it's right here with us, even in our chemistry. It's right here with us. Um, so actually, Jyotish really illumines that. So to understand Rashi's, for instance, uh, my feeling, and I'm very humble about this, I could be wrong, please be protected from my ignorance, but this is what I've observed. It is one of the organs of Kala Purush and it needs to be understood what organ it is. So like, here's the example of nakshatras. So you're born into Dashapati at birth because everyone has a mother, everyone has a yeah. womb, a yoni that they're born out of. Even if you're born in a test tube, let's say Augustia Muni was born in a kumba, a pot. Yeah. We don't, probably some genetic thing we don't know. So, um, but that's still a womb. It's still jala tatwa. It's still, it's still water. You're still born out of a mother, so to speak. Feminine attribute. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so everyone... I think you're frozen there. And you have no control over moon. That's why it's called Janma, just like you have no control over birth. Like if you consider what gave you your parents, this is so critical, Kapil, I can't even tell you. This is like for understanding Jyotish, if we separate it from actual life and we start philosophizing and um is going on Western theology, like moon is just emotion and a woman's body and all that. We are missing big uh, clues to the sacred, the, even how Jyotish could lead us on our spiritual path. Um, for those of you who are more interested in the inward moving prana, the inward moving uh, airs, you could say. Um, Jyotish is very helpful, but if your understanding of it is correct, it's more helpful. Um, so 
We have no control over parents. So your moon is awake at birth because whatever the karma was in the previous life got you this life. If your parents want to throw you out, you can't stop them. If they want to love you, you can't. That is that um, invisible force of whatever karma, whatever that force of physics that karma is. Mm -hmm. It happens mostly through the moon for a human being. So saying the moon is only emotional, please, guys, please start considering to adjust that. Does it have an effect, a huge effect on psychology? Yes. And we're going to discuss that with the Rashis. Has a huge effect on psychology because your first imprint of nourishment does. If your mother loves you or your parents, it doesn't even have to be mother, your parents, those who are caring for you, they are in the role of that Shakti of growth, nourishment, care, love. So of course the early psychology is going to get affected by that. And the two grahas that get dig ball in the fourth house of psychology, the hidden psychology and intimacy is in the fourth house, are Shukra and Chandra, who rule the second house because of that. Okay, so that's very important. Like this is uh, something that if you grasp um, how to work with the Janma, you might discover some secrets of possibly how to break free because the lagna, break out of prison. This life is a prison. The so lagna is your free will. And everyone keeps reading the chart from the lagna from these dashas as well. When Briyat or Shastra even tells us to look at the 12th and 2nd from the dashapati. See, he's letting you know to look at actually the chart from the angle of the dashapati. See, the nakshatras are completely, we could do a whole video on that if you want to at some point. Like, with right. just the, okay, so we'll leave that for now. Um, but let's go to the Rashis now. So I just wanted to highlight the nakshatras are functioning in some organ in Kala Purush. Right. And they are activated by the dashapati, not by the Rashi Lord. That's so important, guys. The Rashi Lords are more linked with the solar energy. So we really need to do um, concentration on Surya to understand the Rashis. Now, what's interesting about this is the Rashis and the Bhavas will end up having a very critical link because both are heavily entwined with Surya Dev. So Surya we all know the lagna or the rising sign is the rising point of Surya. It's the eastern mm -hmm. direction. So we know it's the rising. The noon point is the 10th house where Surya is exposed and Surya gets digball. He is the most least intimate graha. <laughs> he has no care for intimacy. Neither does Mangal. And they both get digball in the 10th house which is the least intimate house is exposed It's noon, totally exposed. So that's Makara. It is the least, a point of least intimacy. Does that mean a Makara person can't be intimate? No. <laughs> so we, we need to be careful with this stuff with like, Oh, I'm Makara. My personality is like this. Please guys. Too. For now, throw out personality because what we're trying to understand first about the Rashis is just nature. Because if we understand nature, what we're really trying to understand with Jyotish is the Kal Purush, because every little every person is a little Kal Purush, and you are bound by sun scars, impressions from the previous life. And if you want Agni to set you free. If you want your life to become a living duni, you have to find you. You have to know what it is to burn, what it, what it is to eat, what needs to be devoured. So, getting hung up on your personality and I'm Leo, so I behave like this. It's useful for psychological astrology, but I don't know if it's useful for spiritual astrology. And psychology and real spirituality may be at heads a little bit right now because real spirituality doesn't coddle you in the same way <laughs> that psychology does right now. It doesn't coddle you. 
it's you have it's not for the faint of heart real love is not for the faint of heart and you have to have love for the path to even go on it and even for those of you who only want astrology for material things let's just say that even then you should understand this mechanically first before you get into all the personality stuff because you can hit your goal easier Okay, so understanding that Makara, the karmas that will be released through Makara are not as personal, they're not as um, intimate, even if the person's personality desires intimacy, the karmas that may be released through Makara are not as intimate. So some of the nakshatras like Dhanishta has, can have some struggles in that realm of intimacy okay so some of those nakshatras are um letting you know that they belong more to the world vishnu lives in makara very much through the nakshatras lord vishnu and when he comes he belongs to the world so the 10th house belongs to the world not to you so Jaimini also says some interesting, he implies, I should say. It's like kind of like two plus two, but we don't have the equal score. Um, this is what I've gathered. Okay. Uh, the person is the Lugna and the Lugna Lord. So this is heavily Rashi, but also Nakshatra you should consider. And the rest of the chart is going to happen to the person. So like if, you feel frightened of a person because they have a moon Saturn K through conjunction in the 10th. If that sad, if that moon's not the Lord of the first, it might not even affect who they are as a personality. It might be what's going to happen to them through Janma through birth, that they're going to be on the receiving end of this Shani K through moon business. And then we have to determine what that is. Is it really that bad? Is it really that bad? You know, people tear. Isn't that then? Um, then don't the degrees come into play then? Because if let's say Moon is the lowest degree compared to Saturn and Ketu, then what's happening is Moon is going forward towards Saturn and Ketu, so it's going to hit a break. There'll be a break with the mother, perhaps. There'll be this coldness, this feeling of abandonment can come in that the person's gonna experience. But if moon is the higher degree than Ketu and Saturn, it has left that behind. It was experienced in the past. Now it is here to experience something. Let's say Jupiter's on the next house is going to experience something more in, in terms of uh, you know prosperity. I guess that could play that role. That's really interesting you say that Kapil G because actually there's a whole form of astrology you're tapping into you probably know then that does deal with who's ahead whether it's a faster yeah. moving planet or a slower moving planet yeah yeah like for example like they say with uh, if uh ketu is ahead of uh, or, or if saturn is below ketu's degree then one can experience constant breaks in their profession and you know they will only attract ketu like individuals to come to them you know in their profession also you know, like monks or people don't who who are not there to help you. They're just there to give you some karma towards you. That's it. <laughs> yeah, it's a really so, yeah, these... thing to watch. Yeah, because the tenth house belongs to the world. Yeah. So yeah, very commonly it affects the person's external life, very much so. And so, in the fourth house belongs to the intimacy of you. It's it's a house of homes, but the, your first home is your mind. And it's actually the real point of secret. So I would say that eighth house is, is actually visible on the horizon. So people need to reconsider the eighth house being the place of secrets. I don't know if it's really the place of secrets. I, I don't know if that's actually the right word. See, all the moksha houses deal with some kind of secretive energy because Jalatatwa always has that uh, disposition. Um, and, and also the eighth house is always looking towards the setting sun because it's about to set. So the eighth house, I would say, becomes very aware of vulnerabilities. So it does become a place of power and weakness in that, in that regard, like the, 
the whole consideration of um, security. So you'll see a lot of insurance brokers and, and things like that. They'll just have a loaded eighth house. They're like a lawyer that deals with insurance. You know, yeah. they have nothing to do with mysticism or something like that. And that's because security, Vrishchika Rashi has a lot to do with security. And you'll see a lot of CEOs and things like that, like people at the top of things with Vrishchika, even sometimes more than Vrishab. Everyone thinks that Taurus is going to be this you know, world is often very creative. Taurus is often very, very creative. Um, but anyway, so so Taurus being like a sign of life and growth, Scorpio is going to be the opposite. It's looking at death, whereas Taurus is looking at the rising sun. It's looking at life. Because the second house is looking at the rising. It's about to come up, right? It's moving this way, the bhavas. So you have the eighth house about to set. So it is looking at death. But it's also right. looking at the partner. It's also looking at other people. It's also looking at things of the seventh. And it's second from the seventh. So that's why A.V. Sundaram and some really fabulous astrologers would use eighth house for timing of marriage. So, it, you know, the eighth house is looking at the western point where the sun sets. So therefore, looking at your death marriage <laughs> right the two marica houses finances no and i said you're looking at the timing <laughs> of marriage the way it comes. you're looking at your death yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense it's like it's very true it's like eating finances marriage dead <laughs> but, like, yeah. so, those guys must have had a sense of humor um it's that two houses of shukra you know very interesting um, but yeah, so you can tell a lot by the Rashis, by the Bhavas, even though they are very separate. I don't argue with astrologers when there's some astrologers that take the thought that please don't relate Mesha to the first house. Like, please don't relate Aries to the first house because they're separate. That is true to a degree. That more comes into like a Nadi concept, I think. In Nadi, they kind of just used like fourth house and the ninth house, meaning the the cancer sign is now reflecting the four thousand and nine. The yeah, I get that. Yeah, but but really speaking, um, if you don't understand that they're all opposite, yeah, you don't even get the first concept of what they are doing. So this whole thing with secrets, for instance, um, in the fourth house, um, secrets often get exposed for instance like you can do studies on it if there's a prominent planet like the lugna lord in the fourth and rahu goes over it things like that like secrets will get exposed more through the fourth house very commonly than the eighth house though the eighth house will cause scandal so if you get the both going on you will see that kind of come that kind of birth happen in someone's i'm not trying to i don't like to get into predictive astrology really let's go back to the rashis so but i'm just saying that you can see this kind of thing um i mean i've observed it throughout the years it works uh so so if you look at the rashis there's a really beautiful thing happening with the marriage of the rashis and the bhavas with Surya, but there's also a really beautiful thing happening with the marriage of the Rashis and the Nakshatras, because like, let's just take Aries and Tula. Let's go to the Kindras. Let's, let's handle the Kindras and then whatever uh -huh. one you want to ask about, let's go from there. Right. So the, the two Kindras, Mesha, Tula, let's just do the natural order. <clears throat> so Aries and Libra. And some of you have heard me say this, so, but this is a good one to start at because in Briat or Shastra, he does mention that when a female has planets or brahas in the seventh and no planet in the first to consider that the seventh house is her lagna. And there's quite a few techniques with female horoscopes that are sixth and seventh house based. Mm -hmm because this is Kanya and Tula, okay? There's a reason for this. So if you look at Mesha, and this is just my perception, everyone can toss it out, please guys. I, at this point, I don't care who loves me or hates me or anything. I, I like, I just, yeah. I have a love, I just have some kind of love for this and I'm talking about it. So take it or okay. leave it. Um, in the seventh house, 
from Aries, you get Tula, which is nothing but the male reproductive system. You have Chitra, the Bija, and even the Dashapati is Mangal. Okay, so, but it, it's the seed, it's the divine architect. Please just think about it. Chitra is very related to Ketu as well. And, and Ketu's names, Chitra Gupta, Chitra Gupta, the Chitra Gupta, the hidden image, the servant of Yama. What do you think gives you your birth besides those impressions? So Chitra is the mystery of the Bija, the seed, the pearl. You ever heard that terminology? The diamond, whatever you want to say is like the pearl. Okay, so this is nothing but the seed and the architecture is within the seed. Okay, and then the sprout, you know, it starts to grow. And then Vishaka is the chemistry. Vishaka, see, you've got the chemistry reflected on both sides. With, and, and I'll talk about that. So the Agni, you've got Agni reflecting in both sides because you've got the Indra Agni and Vishaka, which is the split. That's what happens to the cell mitosis and all of that with the embryo and all you get the, the forms. Uh -huh. Ugly has to be there for the. And Shukra literally means that Shukra Datu in Ayurveda is the male reproductive fluid. Now the female is called Raja and all through the yoga Shastras is considered red and hot and the woman has a menstruation. So if you flip it, if you inverse the Rashis. Right. Okay, Aries becomes the female reproductive system. And all of you can look this up online. Just Google Aries symbol uterus. It's actually, it, they say it's a ram's head, but it actually looks like the, it's a uterus. Right, yes. And yes. the core of it is barring. With the ovaries and all of that, it looks the like Ashwins. a ram, yeah. The Ashwins, the twins, okay? And the um, the uterus is barony. It's the trap. <laughs> Traps you into birth. So it's the star yeah. of restraint. What is getting restrained? The jiva. Through barony, through yama. Yama is life and birth business that we're so fat infatuated with. So um, Barani is that, and Kritika, the heat. Once again, we've got the heat there. We've got the moon's Ucha point coming. But let's say the still the Mesha point is the heat. So that heat makes the fetus start taking the form. The chemistry starts happening. So Vishaka and Kritika have this relationship with the ovum and the marriage of the you know, the male and the feet that the whole thing that's happening in birth. Okay. So you could say that Tula Rashi would be in a way, the natural head of the, of Shakti, you know, with Shani being Ucha and Surya, the natural Lord of the fifth is Ucha in a female's uterus or, or in her reproductive system. Yeah. The child the natural Lord of the fifth, okay? Just, and the Marika for a female becomes Mongol. Mongol ends up ruling the second and seventh. Yeah. Whereas for Aries, Shukra, because we kill you guys. <laughs> so it's just, I'm kind of joking, but you get it, okay? So like Shukra becomes the Marika for the Aries Lagna. But if you flip it and inverse it and you have an opposite thing happening, then you have Shani being Ucha in Tula Rashi. And if you read the Yoga Shastras, if you read any of these things, they're constantly talking about the control of that fluid. And Shani is measured. He, slow, he controls prana. He's of measured speech. Speech is a form of reproduction, by the way. It's considered one of the creative energies. The same tissue is in the mouth that is in a, the female reproductive organ. Literally, this is, you study it in medicine. The same, it's the same tissue. And it's only in those two places. Okay, so these are procreative. Even though we eat here, but it's, we speak here too. This is Vak Devi. 
Saraswati. Okay, so, so the procreative energy in order for the longevity, because Shani is Ayush Karaka. First and foremost, we got to stop being scared of Shani. He's long life indicator. Mangal is actually Akalam Rityu Karaka. So he should, we should probably fear him more if we're going to fear someone. But Shani is Ayush Karaka. Now, granted, he can give a long life to bad things, <laughs> but still he, he is the long life indicator because he controls speech. He's the one of measured speech. So he's always measuring things. If you look at his names, Shani doesn't like to let out too much energy at once. He likes to pace himself. So for a male, Shani being Ucha in the reproduction um, is important for the longevity, like in Yoga Shastra, not to be completely restrained, but to have some restraint. Okay, be healthy, be balanced. Tula Rashi is a sign of balance, actually. And Shani helps that. So when you look at a female, she would have Shani Ucha in the mind or in the head. Mm -hmm. okay. And you hear like a lot of women talking about their timer, their clock, time's running out, all this stuff. I mean, it's kind of funny like that. Uh, but not only that, the I think for females, the control of this thing going on in the mind and um, they, they did studies where if a person is estrogen based, let's forget the biological thing for a minute. Let's just think if a person has more estrogen. Okay. They did studies where if that person sits down, their mind goes, keeps going and working where if someone has more testosterone, like in a male, a, a, males typically do, their mind tends to shut off more when they sit down. Is that not interesting? <laughs> yeah. Things like that become very fascinating. So for the female, you'd have to think about what that might mean for Shani to be Ucha in the head. Okay. So being more thoughtful about what is released through the mouth as well. I think there's something happening with that. Um, and I've also heard that. Uh, and of course, the, in the Western society, everything just becomes so capitalized. But they say there's the yogas that we do, the yoga centers that you go to near Starbucks. There's actually, I, I believe this is what I've heard, that women should be doing different yogas. Men should be doing di different yogas. If you do the same yogas, both, then it'll mess up with e their bodily systems. Like I there's really a separate wish... yoga. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. Um, yeah, the um, I really wish I love the point you just brought up that they're capitalizing on everything on people's yeah. vulnerabilities. And um, that's beginning to break my heart because it's becoming increasingly hard just to have normal conversations. And um, and it actually isn't anyone's fault, but these people that keep perpetuating it in politics and news and all. I mean, it's yep. really disgusting, actually, that they're preying on people's vulnerabilities. I find that very hard pill to swallow. But you're right in traditional understanding. There's no argument that the chemistry is different. Different. Okay, the, just the chemistry. I'm not talking about the mind or anything. I'm talking about the chemistry. And like when a woman's on her menstrual cycle, for instance, it's not that she can't meditate or go in a temple. All this stuff, I, I do think some of these things get out of control and misunderstood. Um, yeah. But you're not supposed to mess with the upana, the upana value at that time for a woman because it is supposed to be moving downward. So if in some yogic practices, you actually reverse the flow of a panavayu and that for a woman on her menstrual cycle or a woman who's pregnant and she's near the time of giving birth, things like that, you don't want to mm. mess with the prana um, in certain ways because nature, the, the airs are moving in that direction for a biological reason. 
Yeah. So um, you can cause some complications. And if someone already has a hormonal imbalance, let's say, okay, um, because honestly, there was no issue in ancient India with any, let me be very clear, with any form of sexuality. Okay, there mm -hmm. was no stigma around most of that. If there was at all, it would be because of cleanliness things. So you will read some things that are against certain sexual acts because of the time you're living in and how clean could you be? <laughs> so um, of course you'll hear things like that, but really you'd be surprised at, you know, even some of the stories of the Devatas um, that it wasn't just this uh, inflexibility with um, sexuality or sensuality. It was actually very diverse, but there was still an acknowledgement, a sophistication with nature. There, there wasn't like an argument with nature, um, you know, for instance. So if you, let's say someone does start going through hormonal therapy and they start taking estrogen, they need to follow the rules in, in yoga shastra that are more estrogen based and dealing with the, the, the Ida Nadi, the feminine Nadi, the channel, cause it's going to get more. So there's, there's a lot of um, like the pranas, things start moving differently in the body based on chemistry. Chemistry is sacred. There's nothing separate about our bodies and the spirit. This, who has woven this creation? The intelligence, it, it, why do we need some God in the sky? <laughs> yeah. Maybe every cell is intelligent. You know, so this, this intelligence is when it, when we say it's all pervading, it literally is. That's my experience. It's my feeling. Anyone can believe anything, but it, I think it's right here with us. Why, why is, have our bodies become shamed as well? This is another thing. I think that religious shaming is equally as destructive as what these politicians are doing. Please, I, I'm very much against the religious shaming because it gives a fake idea of purity. And it yeah. creates a lot of problems in, in a sadhak's mind. A, a spiritual seeker, it creates a lot of uh, feelings of shame and um, um, inability to direct those energies into other channels. A lot of what you're dealing with in the yoga Shastra is the sexual energy. So if you start shaming it and start um, getting tense about it, and but then if you become too loose with it, you've got another problem. So it's a very difficult topic to discuss and I don't want to, but I, I will say that you can start understanding Jyotish better actually by not being so influenced by either hardcore um, dogmatic religion or hardcore dogmatic po social politics, you've got yeah. to find a way to the middle somehow and ask yourself, you have all of your own answers, actually. You really do. The, it, all indigenous cultures, they had a way of finding your point of reference back to yourself like a, a sh like any kind of medicine person would have never made you reliant on them they would have taught you how to I... care for yourself so with jyotish i would encourage everyone that looking at these rashis you know look at aries and tula don't be ashamed you were born out of a womb your mother and father had to come together with this powerful creative energy a brahma think about this Brahma deals with the Manus, right? All of the Brahma Trimurti nakshatras, they're all like this. Like Ketu, all the Ketu nakshatras are Brahma Trimurti, and they all deal with origin or Pitris, right? The spreading of genetics in this way, like Matsya Avatar is the avatar of Ketu, and he saves the human race. So if you look at like a flame burning, like if you take any idea, like I have here, and you look at the oil, that's like Brahma. That's the Soma. It's like the, the essence of life. That oil is like Brahma. And that blue part of the flame that's in the middle, that's cool, you could say that's like Vishnu in a way. And that top part of the flame that's hot and burning all of it up into smoke is like Lord Shiva. So all three of those, in some way, they have their importance. Like 
the homeostasis of the body. That's Vishnu. That's nothing but Vishnu. Why are we separating? It's sacred how our bodies stay balanced. Mm -hmm. and, and then the anabolic feature of the body, when we build tissue, create tissue, build more tissue, when a child is growing, that's Brahma. And then the catabolic feature, when the cells are getting devoured and getting destroyed, Lord Shiva's eating, devouring you. So this is really beautiful. Life is really, really beautiful in all of its terribleness. <laughs> it's really terrible in one way. It's really, you know, um, really death, injury, all these horrible things we can go through. Pain and mental pain is some of the worst. Um, for all of the terribleness of life, it's really in itself a miracle. Um, so the Rashis, they actually reflect these bigger concepts of life. And the nakshatras are more specified areas of the growth of those karmas. So you've got Aries and Libra. And then let's take the next two kindras, which we were talking about, Cancer and Capricorn. Uh, you have the extreme point of intimacy in the heart. Okay, and you'll even, once again, going back to Yoga Shastra, you'll see a lot about the heart area and being where the jiva is actually bound. Very interesting. It's very interesting. So um, this is a place of uh, very hidden energies. It is the cave, cave of the heart. So cancer is one of the considered one of the most pure signs is the Brahmin. All the water signs are Brahmins. That's another thing. We should know these things because they're letting you know, even Scorpio, the, the sign that everyone tends to talk badly about. I don't know why. Um, it's, it's a Brahmin, Rashi. So the water signs all have to do with it. They all align with the moksha houses. So cancer being the first one is the natural point Ucha point of guru. So if you really contemplate who's Ucha and Micha in these Rashis, um, yeah. you will understand something about them. And it's always based on life. You know, the, the first mother, the first guru is mother or whoever's raising you in that, that role. Um, and uh, the heart must be handled with wisdom, with gravity with actual gravity. I would say guru comes along with gravity. There's also something else about guru that people may not be realizing. Like if you don't read the Navgraha Kavach, if you don't study the Brahmanas, you're missing out with Jyotish. Because guru, not Bud, guru is often for, uh, referred to as the karga of intelligence. So right. Bud is very expressive. He's communicative and he gives skill. But Guru, you know, look at his mantra, right? Devanamcha, Rushinamcha, Rishinamcha, Gurun Kanchana Sanhibam, Budhi Mantam, Triloke Sham, Tam Namami, Brahaspatim. Budhi Mantam. Some say, uh, some say like buddhi budham, but either way, um, and even in the Kavach, we ask guru, not bud, to protect our intelligence. Now we think intelligence is coming from here, but if you read Yoga Shastra, it actually they talk about it coming from here. Mm -hmm. To know the minds of others. You must know the heart. We actually ask Bud to protect our throat. It's a very different thing. So, so actually, the energies of cancer should be handled by the rishis, by guru. You said to study what to um, understand Jyotish? I would say the brahmanas. What is the bra? It's like the shastras. Brahmanas are brahmanas? The, the, yes, they're the ritualistic portions of the okay. Vedas. So, like you okay. have them within the Yajurveda, you have them within yeah, the yeah, yeah. 
Brahmana. Um, so actually, a lot of people give up on reading them because it's so many rituals. Um, but um, you're missing out because they, first of all, they don't really even mention Rashi's guys. I have to really emphasize how Western this has become with using the Rashi lords for everything. The Brahmanas, it's heavy on nakshatras. I actually can't even remember a place where it mentions a Rashi because I've read them. I've read, I, I've read certain sections often because I'd have to remind myself of. Um, and so they each one, they will list, they will list the different rituals that should be done under certain nakshatras and this and that, and you will learn a tremendous amount. And then if you leave out the Qurans, you're also leaving out, even though the Qurans might have come later and there's some religious, you don't know who's who's tampered with what at this point. Because <laughs> like Brihat or Shastra clearly has a lot of Greek. Anyone who knows a little classical Greek will tell you. It's not right. debatable. It's got some Greek in it, which is clearly not from <laughs> Rishi Parashara, right? <laughs> so... Um, but uh, you could say that uh, the Purans are still very important as well because like you get different nakshatra kala purushas, you get different um, fruits of the nakshatras, uh, like the Ramayana and Mahabharata. Mahabharata is very important, the Ramayana. They, they list things about the grahas. There's many stories. Um, I would even tell people to start out, there's a little book called the Navgraha Puran. Um, and it's just a collection of stories from various Puranas um, about the birth of the Grahas and all of these things, which if you don't invest your time in this, you're just going to go regurgitating the same things you hear online. You won't right. have access to fresh stimulation of um it will nothing will pique your curiosity you well, like for example you know like they said in mahabharata with is retrograde saturn it aspects reverses the third aspect if saturn is in the fourth if it's retrograde then second house will receive its aspect tenth and seventh instead of the first and sixth and you know tenth see that's a whole other thing by the way is the like the savya and upsavya nakshatras of Kala Chakra Dasha, like how they go forward and backward and there's groups of them. You know, there's other chakras that do that and we're not using them. For instance, if Ketu is involved in a graha, it's considered that you're supposed to possibly read it backwards. So there okay. are rules like this. Okay, so like there's there's some some interesting things. In some, like Mahortha Chintamani, maybe, to think of this, there's there's one shloka, I, I, I need to find this because I've been thinking about it recently. Once again, they give the two plus two, but they don't give equals four. Okay, mm -hmm. So like they let you know that perhaps because the person has a night birth, that <sighs> things should be backwards. Because the, wait, wait, wait. the airs, airs is that this certain technique should be considered backwards, okay? Okay. Okay, so um, the airs move differently at night. The prana is moving. The prana shakti is always moving. And it moves differently in the day than it does in the night. The lord of the night is Chandra. The lord of the day is Surya. Surya is our natural nakshatra. The nakshatra for this earth, the fixed star for this earth. <laughs> he, he is there. He's a big star, right? And he has a very specific kind of fixed um, movement and energy. I mean, truly, um, you know, I'm going to be doing the, the conference. And one of the things I'm going to be showing people visually, which I can just mention here, is how much the sky looks like like if you look at Surya he looks like a bend if you speed up time let me preface this if you speed up time to watch all yeah. the planets, you'll see Surya just going straight you know like kind of arched but he goes straight looks like the Bindu 
looks like it just goes straight, marks a path. What you'll notice is that the moon and the grahas are going like the Ida Pingala. I mean, it's really beautiful. It looks just like our own system. Yeah. And the nakshatras, the stars look like these naughty points. You could even argue that the some of the fixed stars, like some of the even Rashis would be the fixed chakras. Um, I mean, this stuff is explained in Purans. They try to get you to realize um, that this whole thing, as within is without, as above, so below. Um, if you realize, if you meditate on one thing, you get the answer to many things because this is a universe of fractals. Look at Aditi in Cancer. The original mother, she starts the first portion of cancer. She's yeah. the fabric of this universe, what everything is woven out of. She gives birth to all the virtues or the devatas. She's another form of Lakshmi, right? Actually, Bhu Devi, Saraswati. It's interesting. Saraswati, Saraswati and Bhu Devi actually can, they, they share some things. You wouldn't naturally... Some older forms of Saraswati are red. Okay. And, and there's a creative principle, you know? So um, it's sometimes they'll show Sri Vishnu with Lakshmi on one side and Bhu Devi on the other side. And sometimes it's Lakshmi on one side and, Vish and, and uh, Saraswati on the other side. Um, is it That's an interesting concept right there, not to confuse people, but... Even if you read Briyat or Shastra, he talks about the red Shakti being Saraswati. He That's even true. says it. He talks, he says, Bhu Devi, that Vishnu couples with and mates with Bhu Devi, so to speak, uh, to create the world. And he says it's Saraswati. So you can just, you can read it yourself. And then there's Neil Shakti, the blue Shakti, which is Durga, to to destroy the universe like this. So, and he rules over the universe. He perv pervades over it, just like I was saying, like there's intelligence all pervading in every, probably every particle. <laughs> and that all pervasiveness, Vishnu, the only difference, he's awake. See, there's a lot about waking, dreaming, sleeping as well. Like everyone is God, but they may be sleeping God. <laughs> Let's just say it that way. Yeah. You look at the eyes of a person and you see God. It might be a dreaming God or a sleeping God, but not an awake God. So let's say Sri Vishnu is the one that's awake, the intelligence that is constantly awake in all particles. It is hard to, it's because it's not the concept of a monotheistic God. It's different. It's different, but it's right here. That's all I'm trying to say. You can love it right here in the people around you, in, in anything, I, I think anything, love is probably the most intelligent thing. We often think it's emotional. Emotional, emotions can take you away from love. So how is emotion love? Love can make you very sober actually, and very uh, still. It, it, love is not for the faint of heart. Like you'll hear this lion hearted, right. <laughs> you'll hear like, the person is lion hearted, right? Or something like the heart is often referred to as a place of bravery. Um, so anyway, cancer, going back to cancer, going on this concept of love and all of this. Um, no, actually, I wanted to ask you one more thing. I know you said guru is exalted in cancer, right? Yeah. Bara Mira has also said that it's exalted more higher in Leo and even higher in Aquarius. What is... It, it, those are really, some of this is sukshma jyotish or like guya vidya, like hidden is cryptic. He was one of the master astrologers, really. Not many of these guys had his mastery. And I do wonder if, you know, how pure the books are, like how much they've been tampered with. But <clears throat> when uh, the Pi team, when we taught our plan uh, planetary class, that's one of the things we talked about was the moon and guru and various sources, both are said to be very much uh, not exalted, but uh, 
awake, like very active in Kumbha Rashi. Mm -hmm. And so there is a secret behind that. I mean, Kumbha Rashi is the natural 11th house. Okay. And it does rule the masses. It is the masses. If you, okay, let's look at this. Let's look at Leo now that you said this. Let's just look at it. Fifth house, 11th house. Let's look at Simha Kumbha. So Simha, you have Surya. And with Surya, you get singular rulership, right? You get the monarchy, you get all that stuff. They talk about that with Leo. I have different thoughts about that, but I'll just keep it simple. So Leo is really the singular authority, a singular authority, rulership, leadership, those kinds of things. When you go across from Leo, you get the people. See, Shani is always on the other side of the luminaries. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because he's the he actually cares about the masses. Right. Okay. So those two luminaries are indicators of self, but others are always across from the self. Always. So if the Lugna is the indicator of self, Aries is another one, and Sun is Ucha there, the singular guy is Ucha there, then others is in the seventh house, right? Yeah. So with Leo, you're really dealing with this autonomous creative intelligence. Okay, so it, is, it is a sign of um, personal willpower, personal creativity, all of those things. That, and when I say creativity, I don't really feel like it's the right word. People think of like musical instruments and all of that. Yeah. But actually creativity comes into every walk of life. Um, really, really. Like even a person who creates scenarios in their life through interacting with people, the way you interact with people. Like the fourth and fifth house are actually very psychological, believe it or not, because they deal with the person's, um, one of them deals with their ability to create, to problem solve in a creative way. Like Soria has a lot to do with that. He has a lot to do with your ability for leadership. And please don't think that if you have a Nietzsche Soria, you can't be a leader. As a matter of fact, many leaders have a Nietzsche Soria. So this is a misunderstanding. Debil So-called mm -hmm. debilitated Soria actually can become a more powerful leader in many cases, okay? Because Tula Rashi is quite a little political. How funny is it that I lost you? Oh, oh, okay. Um, no, my battery ran out. I just texted you as well uh, and so i went and got the adapter and plugged it in so i can't believe this is still recording okay that's cool it's still recording are you there yeah okay so um do you want to press record again um, i think it is recording yeah it was recording continuously What's Hello? the omen there? And I think you froze again, but we lost you on Leo, on Simha. Yeah, Leo, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, people with, you know, heavy fourth and fifth house very commonly um, are very, very, there's something knowledge they have of other people's psychology. This is, this is a very, You'll see this. And that's why I, what I was saying when I lost you was that um, that's why Jaimini makes the reference that to be a Jyotishi, you might want a malefic in the fourth. Same thing with the fifth. Okay. So the luminaries in some way, they do have this interpersonal knowledge of people, the sun in his way, the moon in his way. But if you see Leo is very good at managing people. Very good. And Leo doesn't mind being behind the scenes a lot. When people say that um, Leo always has to be in front of the camera, I mean, you will see that. But you'll see that a lot actually with Mituna, Gemini, that they actually want that. I think there's more of a preference and there's a reason for that. But with Leo, you if they just have prominent Simharashi, a lot of times you'll see that 
Um, they may even prefer their solitude. You know, and yeah. just to run, run things from behind the scenes. People's psychology yeah. can really affect them. Because because Simha actually really does have a deep understanding of the psychology of the masses. Okay. It, it's it very important to understand that about Simha. Because I think Simha gets mislabeled a lot. Leo gets mislabeled a lot. It is actually much more empathetic than people assume as well. Because the sun is one of the leaders, and to be a real leader of people, you have to know their hearts. Yeah. They say the truth of the heart is in the fifth house. Okay, so, but that's the singular person. So why would Guru do well in both of the luminaries? First of all, we're, we've both, they're both Sattva Guna as well. So Surya and Chandra are Sattva Guna, and so is Guru. So now what is Sattva Guna? If you study like Sankhya philosophy, you're going to have a different concept than what the modern yogic philosophy is like, just eat a carrot and bask yeah. in the sun, wake up at sunrise. Yeah. <laughs> you know, no, actually all of the Gyan Indriyas and Karm Indriyas, all of the senses that gain knowledge of this world are under Sattva Guna. So your senses are actually said to be pure. Okay, so once again, there's a lot of scrambled understanding. So Guru actually gives that mahat, that organizational intelligence, the discrimination of where to apply those personal senses. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why he does very well with Cancer and Leo, because he gives he can give the right direction there. But he's also a Kash Tatwa. Let me just get a little deeper with this if you feel people can go there. I know a right. lot of people are like, when am I going to get my house or something? But I can't answer that. <laughs> I'm not your person. <laughs> if I, I hope you get what you want, but I'm not the person to answer those kind of questions. I actually don't know. I don't get into that kind of Jyotish. Mm, you're pretty well, accurate at that. <laughs> well, let's forget that. I don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but uh, so, so, um, so with Chandra and Surya, because they are the person, you have the natural Atma Karka and the natural Manas Karka, the Jiva Karka. See, Guru is Jiva Karka. He's also the main Jnana Karka, one of the main Karkas of knowledge, right? But it's, it's not information. Bud deals with information. <laughs> Like me running my mouth here, you, if you guys haven't guessed it, there's got to be something with Bood, okay? <laughs> How I can see, like, okay, it has to be, it has to be. Um, Guru, he is a speaker, by the way. He does rule Vak Siddhi, actually. So he is an orator. They say you get or oratory skills from Guru. And you'll see evidence in people like, you know, like Martin Luther King with the nice yoga he had of Mangal and Rahu in the second in a sign of Guru. You know, so you will see like Meena Rashi. Oh, also the karka of the second house of speech. So yes, that... Jupiter is the karka of the majority of the houses. Yeah. Okay. So he is a big graha, no, not just figuratively. Like he actually, because he's a kash tatwa as well, he's dealing with sound. So if you, if you study some of the yoga shastras, they have one that is dedicated all the way to the Nada Bindu. And the fourth and fifth houses are two houses of deep jnanam meditation. So actually you get a lot of musicians in our modern society, Jimi Hendrix, I could go down a list where Guru is in either Ucha, Swa, or Simha Rashi. He's either in his own sign, exalted, or in Simha. You will see this so much strong placement of guru for musicians. And it's not because of the skill. That's once again going to be Bud. Yeah. So the Jnana Karakas are actually Bud, Guru, and Shukra. The days of the week, there's a chakra that lets you know about the qualities of these grahas. And actually the Rashis, this this applies because you've got the Surya and the Chandra, which are in the category of self. They, they're indicators mm -hmm. of self. You know, Monday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. 
So you've got Surya, Chandra, Mangal, Atma Karka, Manas Karka, Deha Karka, soul, mind, body. Okay. Those guys, very hard to shift in one lifetime. Okay. This is the part of Jyotish I won't get into, but those are very hard to shift. After that, you have Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Budwar, Guruvar, Shukwar. Shukravar, yeah. Okay. So Shukravar, Friday is Venus, a final Gyanakarka. Okay. So you you have Mercury for information. You have Guru for Gyanam. Okay, meditation, this this kind of thing, like music is a meditation. He is a Kash Tatwa, guys. You know, this is important because the old school teachers taught auditorily. You had to mm -hmm. listen. So he he carries this, uh, the sacredness of sound is really probably <laughs> much deeper knowledge than reading books. And Booth might love his books and he might be able to tell you everything in the library, but uh, Guru will have deeper knowledge possibly just by reciting a mantra. And the fifth house is the house of mantra Shakti as well, mantra Sadhana and all of this. Right. Okay, so so remember this because that means Leo. Leo can be one of the most spiritual signs. You will see this. See, this is why I don't like the misconceptions. Oh, Leo wants attention. All the, uh, just you got to throw these out because actually Leo can be a sign of the Rishis. So once again, putting Guru there. It's the natural fifth house. Fifth house is one of the most important houses. So um, so then you get Shukra, who's the Jnana Karaka through yoga. And when I say yoga, I mean experience. Shukra is more dangerous in this way because in order to know something, you must become one with it. Mm -hmm. In order to know, okay, lovers, in order for them to know each other, they have to come together and yeah. know each other. They, like you get a little kid talking about making love, it's going to be funny because they, they don't know. <laughs> they haven't had the experience like they don't know what it is to create a child or something. They, they're they just going to talk, right? This is the information. This is how funny Mercury is. <laughs> so, yeah. but when you get to Shukra, it's the actual experience of the union. So Shukra is the, being the natural yoga karaka and representing all forms of union um, is more interested in becoming that. And... This is this is why actually he's a little bit more rebellious and less cooperative than the other two when it comes to religious rules and Shukracharya, you know, getting the reputation as the guru of the Daityas and the Rakshasas and all. It's a very bad misunderstanding, but Shukra is more likely to get involved in things that it's like I need to experience this for myself. I don't want to just be told in a book and I don't want to just meditate on it. I don't want to just do a mantra. I want to become one with this. And so Shukra is very serious. Once he sets his mind, he's got one eye that has multiple references, but he has one focus once he realizes his goal of union. It, you know, so, so they're the jnana kargas, the three ways we're gaining knowledge. Um, Shukra is through love and through union in the end. <clears throat> and then after that, you get the heavy karma karakas that everyone's afraid of on Saturday, on Shaniwar. Okay, mm -hmm. so you kind of lump Ketu into that. <laughs> uh, in I mean, yeah. If you really look at it, people should be more worried about Wednesday than Saturday. Why? Because I you're Prarabdha karma, pending karma occurs in the sixth house with Virgo. That unchangeable karma, as they say. That's something, it's a gift, a curse, both, because you can't change that. You're going to get that. You know, Shani is karma. You do your karma, you change whatever mess ups you have made. You can actually change some of those things. But that unchangeable Buddha, Virgo. That's an interesting concept because ka and karma actually implies action or activity yeah 
Ha is always present with Brahma. At Brahma used to be called just the syllable ka. Once again, if you study the Puran, you'll know. If you don't, you won't. So he actually was called that syllable. So like words like comma, you know, we're talking about ka in the, the alphabet, but if you add the long A, whatever, but there's still the, the root is still ka. So like for Brahma, the active principle, um, it does mean that you can change karma. So I hate, but I just want to preface that for people so they don't get afraid because it is an active principle. It's implying you've got to act. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting about the sixth house, because you're right, it's going to get dealt to you. <laughs> Yeah. Whatever's in the sixth house. Buddha actually deals a lot to people because he's Prutvi Tatwa. Right. He's the earth element. So he deals, you're right. You're dead on about that. Kanya Rashi is a very strange Rashi because of that. If you read Jaimini, there's a lot of that emphasis on the third, sixth house from the Aruda and all of that. If you study yeah. that. So third and six, which are the two houses of Buddha, are very warlike. <laughs> right. One's the weapons, the other one's the war. And, you know, you get lawyers in the sixth house very commonly. Yeah. Buddha actually is considered to be the lawyer. In many of the texts, he's considered to be one who recites the law. So, yeah, like a defense lawyer. So Booth has some fight in him, actually. <laughs> he's actually, you know, he's a, he's a master at debate. Yeah. So, so, yeah, this is, it's actually true. Wednesday, actually, in some places, you're not supposed to do anything. <laughs> it's more likely I would to love that. confusion and all of that. But, yeah, so let's take, let's take Kanya Rashi then and Mina Rashi. Mm -hmm. So who do we get Ucha and Nietzsche? But then Shukra. And the nakshatras tell a bigger story, so we could do that later. But just taking the Rashi is very simple. I mean, I actually just made a video yesterday on it. I'm, I said that Buddha is debilitated in the 12th house. Okay? 12th house is asleep. Buddha, which is not only the nervous system, it says if you look at his debilitated state, it, it keeps your mind busy even when you're sleeping. So because of his debilitation, you dream. Because you're not really supposed to dream. You should have a deep sleep. But it is that nature of the Buddha that takes you into, you're still awakened. That, hey, I'm here. Look, I'm dancing. So that's a really profound point if you realize what you just, what you just illumined is really profound, Kapilji, because you're getting at a very powerful point. What is sleep? Sleep is... Just pretty much being dead temporarily, you know? Okay, so Shukra loves all the things where you forget yourself, which is the small deaths, the little death, right? All the procreation. Intoxication and sleeping, <laughs> ecstasy, <laughs> orgasms. Sex, orgasm, sleep. So it is a forgetting of the intellect. It is an actual forgetting of the, the intellect cannot be functioning. It's profound. So it's actually what I'm getting at is he prevents samadhi. Samadhi is, that is what they may be alluring to is that he's sober. <laughs> he's he's uh, analyzing things that should not be analyzed. There are things that should never be spoken. Like between two lovers or two to people like even even shishya and guru sometimes there's secrets that are shared that should never be spoken or never should be even analyzed really it just it is what it it just is so what's interesting about this whole thing with shukra and kanya is that kanya has a lot to do with roop form mercury is the guy of form like his the mahavidyas like if you study the mahavidyas uh, the one most linked with Bud is actually uh, Tripura Sundari, the mo most beautiful, the most well formed. Mm -hmm. okay? She's the most, she's said to be the most well formed. Everything about her is perfect. 
So actually, Shukra gets a bit trapped in form, especially they're letting you know because it's Chitra Nakshatra. And it is, um, <clears throat> it is, it is triple Thomas. And Thomas is the material. So the Shukra who wants to have union is now trapped in form. Okay, now that, it, that, it gets forced into the physical form of union instead of the divine form, it which can. is exalted. It can definitely mean that. It can definitely yeah. mean that. Now, do you still see people who attain great meditation and jnanam with Mercury and Pisces and Venus and Virgo? Yes. Yeah. So, see, this kind of thing is dangerous because people start thinking real black and white as if, oh, if you have Mercury and Pisces, you can't go into Samadhi. That is not what I'm saying. You know, no, I've seen PhDs with people with Mercury and debilitation. I'm like, that's when I, I just like. Yeah, abstract intelligence gets heightened. Yeah. And actually, the ability to meditate on something becomes even empowered. It, Kanya, yeah. actually, in the, with Shukra and Kanya in Venus, you like. Uh, Prabhupada of the Hare Krishna. I mean, whether you like him or not, or whether you respect, it doesn't matter. It's not about that. It's his whole life was devoted to this. I mean, he was clearly focused. He was clearly, um, and he had Shukra and Kanya. Um, mm -hmm. So, and you, it's not that. As a matter of fact, I there was a famous uh, Zen guru who died recently, and I can't remember his name right now, but he also had a Nietzsche Shukra. I believe in the fourth, so it was getting dig ball, but it, it, I'd have to see his chart again, but he also had the Nietzsche Shukra, um, actually can do very well with Zen, to be honest, because if you combine Mercury and Venus, you, you can get something very unique, but really what we should be looking at is that Ravathi is formless, and Pisces is the Akash, and it is the final sign. And so Shukra gets its full realization in formlessness, in, in just the, the complete dissolution of everything. Okay, so, yeah. so actually the be real beauty is the internal beauty. And that's really, Shukra is looking always to enjoy beauty. See, moon is actual beauty. In most of the texts, moon gives physical beauty. Mercury's even said to. So the planet of beauty is not always Venus. Venus will enhance it. But mm -hmm. what is said of Venus very commonly is that Venus is the enjoyer of those things. So Venus will make you better at being a designer or better at being a musician or better at being an artist because Venus enjoys, delights in those things, delights, mm -hmm. in, delights in poetry, you know, so things like that. So, of course. So a debilitated Venus will simply be feeling trapped because every planet will look at opposite. So it knows this is where it's it's like a, a, a orphan child being born a, and being left a, in a, a nun's monastery or an orphanage. And it's there. That's it. That's his circumstance. But guess where it's looking at? It's looking at something, hopefully, for, hoping for something better. And this is where debilitated Venus, it's there. That's its, that's its karma. That's its uh, some scars. But now it's looking, it says, no, I need to get to that exalted place. This is where I see more debilitated Venus actually come out like the Lotus more than exalted Venus, which is just drunk in its environments. Like I already, I'm here. Why do I need to actually, do anything? That's a productive? good point. Uh, Ucha Grahas give humans a lot of problems because humans notoriously do bad with power. Yeah. And uh, seeing that. Yes. And like, even in Hindi, when you say like Nietzsche, like something's on the ground, like, like get that thing on the ground. That word is, it's like kind of like on the lower shelf or something. Yeah. Does that mean it's bad. Cause actually if fruit falls from a tree, it's easier to yeah. eat. If you have to ucha if you, if you have to go up to get it. <laughs> right. Okay, so actually I've contemplated that a lot because there's yogas. Like if someone has three Nietzsche planets, they're more likely to be wealthy than someone with three Ucha planets. 
there's certain yogas like that that are kind of strange it make you think oh and then some people will get uh, religious philosophical involvement so they'll say oh that's because the person does bad things for wealth yeah that's not true. I see many people with good characters with Nietzsche grahas and, and many right. people with very difficult characters with Ucha grahas and grahas in their own signs. And like our famous friend Hitler, <laughs> who everyone yeah. loves to see his chart, is the perfect example. Ucha son, M Mongol in his uh, Mula Tricone. Yeah. Jupiter's in his Mula Tricone. I mean, Jupiter's in his own Rashi with the moon. Yeah. You know, so one thing about Tula Rashi that's very interesting is that Rishi Parashara says that it's the violent Rashi. And you will see majority of these guys have a Tula Lagna that are, are a lot of Tula, a lot of Libra in politics. It is a lot. Vrishika and uh, Tula are really common, both Scorpio and Libra. But mm -hmm. signs of Venus are very, if you look at Mussolini, he's Taurus and Libra. Hitler had a Taurus, I mean, sorry, a Libra rising sign. Gandhi G, Libra rising sign. Bhagat Singh, tons of Libra. Uh, the gentleman that assassinated Gandhi G, tons of Libra. I mean, you will see Libra being that Rashi more than any other Rashi. Um, mm -hmm. But that's kind of a fascinating thing about Shukra too, is that um, it's probably wise to place Shukra in a sign of Guru. Yeah, because Shukra can be very extreme. I don't know. Everyone says balance and harmony, but I actually see the opposite. See, Shukra's avatar is Parsuram, who slaughtered the political class. Yeah. Another thing about Kanya is that Kanya is said to be the sign of intelligence. Like it's the number one sign of intelligence agencies and all of that. It's the number one sign you'll see with those guys. And many of us consider Kanya to be co-ruled by Rahu. So if you put Rahu and Mercury together, you're going to get someone who is a high level, is intelligence, right? And it can be hidden intelligence and all of that stuff. Um, and Shukra tends to get a bit, uh, you know, that political side of Shukra can be very dangerous. He can, but he is the more extreme than Mongol. People don't realize this a lot, but um, like I've, told people to look at charts like the chart of uh Krapinski or the Unabomber uh, yeah. the, the gentleman who made the uh also the gentleman that made the um killdozer uh that thing you know he he got constantly um constantly really unjustly treated by this one yeah. small he lived in okay and he plotted and for years he built this tank <laughs> to go through the city and destroy it. And he, both of them were Ucha Shukra. Oh, that I remember that newscast where he was going through the city, just, just going running over things. Okay. Uh, both of them were Ucha Shukra. Yeah, so see these Ucha Why well, They were devoted. <laughs> they were devoted. <laughs> yeah. But to what? <laughs> so, yeah. But um, I, I see, this is where we have to be careful. The Rishis might have been telling us a different story. They might have been trying to help us understand something in a deeper way, like giving us three plus five, but not telling us it equals eight once again. Yeah. And we're sitting here saying, oh, this is debilitated, so it's going to cause problems. But that might not have been what they were really saying originally. That, that I suspect. You see, what the problem is, is that whenever you look at any planet debilitated exalted you want to see where other planets are from that planet they're they're going to interact with that planet it's kind of like let's say you make bindi masala bindi and i'm like oh look here's garlic that's that's ucha and then here's garam masala that's nicha but you take garlic ginger onion and and you take the uh, mustard oil you do that and now you have this Bindi, masala, bindi, right? Bindi masala. That's how it needs to be looked at. <laughs> like, you're, we're, we're trying to always separate, like eating, oh yeah, I taste garlic and garam masala is there. No, it's, that's the dish right there. It's like the whole chart is there interacting with each other. So if like a person has exalted moon, but Rahu is 12th from that moon, 
their subconscious is now being guided by that Rahu, which is more lustful than being creative, more obsessive, like a stalker. Oh, than... It's interesting. So... That, that's an interesting point because there's a whole kinds of yogas, right? If something's 12th or second from moon, 12th or second. From yeah. Sun. So there's a whole class of yogas for that, for that reason. So you're absolutely right, right that you can't really determine the level of consciousness either. I, I really hope that all of us as Jyotishis stop branding people. I, it's a prayer that I have. It's a prayer that I have. I don't like people leaving a session feeling like they were not seen. And this is happening really badly, even with really good astrologers, because I think there's some form of a black and white kind of conformity to a religious view almost that has sunk into our minds. And when, when we see certain combinations, we think, oh, that's going to be bad, but you have to look deeper. You must look deeper because you will get two people born on the same day. And that same conjunction is going to manifest that same masala is going to taste very different. So maybe there's a part of Jyotish, if we're studying the time person, we may not be studying the soul, even though Surya's Atmakarga, you know, we don't know the consciousness level of the person, we're studying that which is getting consumed by time. So right. that's really, we need to put that in proper context. And, and I'm even working on it myself. I'm very humble about this because I look back and some of the mistakes I've made, I feel like they've always come through not following my original impulse, which was to really take out any notion of good or bad and just read it as you would like you. Okay. Look at something in nature, a cactus. Is it good or bad? It's actually, many of them are very beautiful. <laughs> cactus can grow in this beautiful way. I mean, if you get close to it, it might have some crura element to it. It might, you might get stabbed or something. It's not the kind of yeah. plant you should be coddling, <laughs> but is it beautiful? You and is it, it, does it have its own existence in its own way? Yes. Yeah. You okay. know, I don't even, I don't know if you know, but Nagarjuna was a Jyotishi before he became a Buddhist. That's so interesting. You bring up Nagarjuna. Why not? I, 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 for some reason, keep meaning to read about him, and I haven't. <laughs> no, because, yeah, my Very uncle uh, in California, he is now into Buddhism. And he used to dismiss astrology. And then he finally understood Buddhism and how Nagarjuna was Jochi and how he looked at things and how he looked at, you know, the inner self. And then that's when he saw and then talked to me. And then I've said, this is when you met your guru, didn't you? He's like, yes. So he started to get this. So that's when he's like, you know, see if you can read more on Nagarjuna. He was a great astrologer. Wow. Okay. Well, then I should read too. I, I don't know yeah. much about him, but I, that's interesting because I do feel this about Jyotish Kapilji. Like I, I do really feel, I know it's a real science. It's a real Vidya yeah. and it can be extremely helpful, but there's very few of us that are Nagarjuna. There's very few of us yeah. that have that purity of sight. And so if then if we're going into a reading with someone and we're damning them because they have a Nietzsche mongol, I mean, I, I, I know I've mentioned this in other talks, but this is a very real thing I did with a group of students. And if they're listening, they can attest to this. Um, in one class on Devi Mahatmyam, it wasn't even really all the way on Jyotish. It was just more about the benefic side of the malefics based on some things in some secrets and Devi Mahatmyam. It's just a fun class for me because it's what I love. So I, one of the things I wanted to show the class was how many um, athletes had Nietzsche Mars. There were so many I couldn't print it. I couldn't even make the PDF. Like I couldn't even show it to them. I just had to paste like three pages. I mean, the greatest of them all, Michael Jordan, has a yeah. debilitated Mars. Exactly. And people will say, oh, it's because there's a Parivartna with Moon. But I can um, just I can just prove that. Luke, I was telling you, he's born in an environment, but he's trying to get to its highest. So he worked the hardest 
and became the best because he knew he had to get better, 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 better. That competitiveness well, the Rishis became... don't tell us everything. <laughs> they huh? don't tell us. The Rishis didn't tell us everything. Yeah. Too. What's interesting yeah. about cancer is it's a powerful sign. Think about the ocean. People mistake the moon for weakness. Let me ask you this. What was wrong? Lord wrong. What was his moon? Cancer. And he was known as what? The perfect Shantri. king. Yeah. And he was he defeated Robin. Yeah. What was his brother's bar Bharat's moon? I think Barney? No, cancer. They were all cancer. Lakshmana. Oh, cancer. Oh. Lakshmana. He had a very Barney attitude, Lakshman. Oh, well, Lakshman was actually Ashlesha. He was Sheshnag. Ashlesha, yes. Sorry, Ashlesha, not. So, well, yeah, see, okay, okay. Balaram, Balaram, sometimes you'll see paintings of Balaram and he's turning okay. into space dog, returning to the ocean because he was yeah. also Ashlesha. Um, yeah. it, so Nag always comes with Sri Vishnu. So, so Ram, his brother Lakshmana, Ashlesha, but that tells you something about Ashlesha is actually divine, is Sheshnag. Yeah. And everyone talks so badly. And the loyalty of the brother to the avatar is unbelievable. So people are missing loyalty with Ashlesh. They're missing a lot with the Naga's severe loyalty. I mean, it's almost a frightening kind of loyalty. It can be. Okay, it can be. They can go opposite too mm -hmm. because human psychology is such. I, I don't know what's wrong today, but... I even charged my laptop, but it's not charging and it's about to run out of battery again. Well, we've been I going have two a long minutes time. of battery left. We've been going a long time. So we yeah. should probably just close. <laughs> close <laughs> and then let's do the second part when I can do it on my desktop because okay. Twitter has been a very weird day with the tech. Well, we did a we did a, a pie team movie. <laughs> yeah, we did a pie team movie again. Thanks a lot. <laughs> no songs. <laughs> So, I mean, this is just, I guess you can just list this as some kind of chat. I don't know who's okay. going to sit through it, but. Um, but uh, They'll watch, trust me. Um, okay. But yeah, it's going to run out soon. So yeah, let's let me close. end this here right now. Yeah, yeah, let's close. Um, Bye. Om Namah Shivaya. Bye.